Good day, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the Holy Cross of Davao College for inviting me to be part of the first International Research Congress. It is my singular honor and great pleasure to deliver a keynote speech in this event. My talk revolves around the concept known as the Internationalization of Research, or IOR. It mainly focuses on IOR in the Philippines. Specifically, it explores the strategies for and challenges of IOR in the country. To shed more light on these matters, I shall discuss the following. What is Internationalization of Higher Education, or IOHE? What is Internationalization of Research, or IOR? Why aspire for IOR, status quo of research performance in the Philippines, major indicators of IOR, strategies for IOR in the Philippines, and challenges of IOR in the country. There is no denying that we live in a highly globalized environment. Countries around the globe are made interconnected, interdependent, and even borderless as a result of economy and technology. Globalization indeed has made people, money, products, and ideas circulate with greater speed than ever before, not to mention the rapid global effects caused by diseases and devastations, like the COVID-19 pandemic that we are experiencing at present and the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Scholars argued that one of the necessary responses to globalization is the internationalization of higher education. According to Dewitt et al. 2015, the internationalization of higher education has been influenced by globalization of our economies and societies and the increased importance of knowledge. Consequently, the internationalization of higher education has become the prime mover for the internationalization of research, considering that research is one of the functions, if not the most primordial function, of a higher education institution. While my presentation today does not intend to provide an elaborate distinction between globalization and internationalization, this framework proposed by Knight may be of help in seeing not only the difference, but most importantly, the consequential nature of internationalization with regard to globalization, where globalization is perceived as a catalyst of internationalization, while internationalization is viewed as a response or reaction to globalization. Knight purported that internationalization can be seen as a strategy for societies and institutions to respond to many demands placed upon them by globalization and as a way for higher education to prepare individuals for engagement in a globalized world. It would therefore prove logical for me to speak briefly first about internationalization of higher education before I delve into the nuances of internationalization of research. Now, what exactly is internationalization of higher education or IOHE? Still according to Knight, an authority in IOHE, internationalization of higher education is described as the process of integrating an international, intercultural, and global dimension into the goals teaching, learning, research, and service functions of a university or higher education system. Moreover, there are two types of IOHE strategies, namely internationalization at home and internationalization abroad. Internationalization at home, on the one hand, is the purposeful integration of international and intercultural dimensions into the formal and informal curriculum for all students within domestic learning environments. This means that activities that promote internationalization of higher education takes place on the home campus, such as attracting foreign students and international guest lecturers. Internationalization abroad, on the other hand, refers to the activities that promote internationalization of higher education and that take place in foreign countries, such as study abroad programs. Examples of these are the Fulbright program of the United States of America and Erasmus Mundus program of the European Union. Both programs aim to enhance the quality of higher education through scholarships, research collaboration, and academic 
cooperation between the USA or UE and the rest of the world. In the Philippines, IOHE was first formally introduced through the Chad Memorandum Order No. 1 Series of 2000, which outlines the policies and guidelines in the implementation of international linkages and twinning programs. Fast forward in the year 2016, the Commission issued the CMO No. 55 Series of 2016, which stipulates the policy framework and strategies on the internationalization of Philippine higher education. It is noteworthy that in CMO No. 55 Series of 2016, Knight's definition of internationalization is the one adapted by the Commission. However, when CHED adopted in the year 2016 Jane Knight's definition of internationalization, the Commission somehow failed to consider Hans DeWitt et al.'s revised definition of the term, which highlights the overarching social contribution of internationalization through education and research. As an outcome of the Delphi panel exercise, their study has revised J. Knight's commonly accepted working definition for internationalization of higher education as the intentional process of integrating an international, intercultural, or global dimension into the purpose, functions, and delivery of post-secondary education in order to enhance the quality of education and research for all students and staff and to make a meaningful contribution to society. There is now an obvious transition from what used to be exclusive and university-contained advantages of internationalization of higher education to a more inclusive, encompassing, and direct benefit that, interna in, that internationalization of higher education brings the society at large. Through this revised definition of IOHE, it becomes crystal clear that higher education and internationalization of it are simply vehicles that shall pave the way towards a better society and a better world. Now, regarding the question what is internationalization of research or IOR, we need not struggle to answer this since in the very first place, Internationalization is an implicitly natural characteristic of research. That is, by its very nature, research has an inherent international dimension. For instance, the publication of scholarly papers indicates that we want the world to read and make use of the knowledge that we have produced. Obviously, no one conducts research, writes a paper, and hides it after completion. A more practical question worthy of answering is, how do we integrate internationalization in the stages of research? Assuming that research is composed of the following stages, namely writing of research proposals, review and approval of proposals by the Research Ethics Committee, as the case may be, conduct of the study, reporting of the study, peer review process, dissemination and publication, we can integrate internationalization in these stages through the following. We may consider inviting Filipino and foreign research experts and scholars with strong global visibility in the conduct of workshops or training activities related to the writing of research proposals. Also, we may consider inviting foreign research experts and scholars with strong global visibility to be part of the institution's research ethics committee. We may collaborate with Filipino and foreign research experts and scholars with strong global visibility in the conduct of research. Further, we may invite Filipino and foreign research experts and scholars with strong global visibility in the editorial board of the institution's journal. We may also require and subsidize faculty members' research presentation in legitimate and non-predatory international conferences. We may require faculty members to publish their research outputs in internationally peer-reviewed journals that are indexed by popular databases. Allow me now to proceed with the next question. Why should we aspire for internationalization of research? In answering this question, I will elaborate on the manifold advantages of IOR. A few of these are as follows. Number one is strengthening the IOR causally means strengthening the IOHE. 
Since research is a primordial function of any higher education institution, strengthening the internationalization of research has a causal effect on the strengthening of the internationalization of higher education. Moreover, strengthening the IOHE consequently contributes to the country's regional and international competitiveness. Number two is program accreditation. Chad Memorandum Order Number 1, Series of 2005, also known as the Revised Policies and Guidelines on Voluntary Accreditation in Aid of Quality and Excellence in Higher Education, encourages of the use of voluntary non-governmental accreditation systems, which outlines a set of policies in full support of an accrediting agency's practices towards regulation for program and institutional accreditation. Still based on CMO number one series of 2005, there are four levels of program accreditation associated to different levels of benefits to HEIs. Specifically, level three accredited undergraduate programs must show a reasonably high standard of instruction and a highly visible community extension program plus any two areas of choice from the following choices, research, faculty development, licensure exam, consortia or linkages, and library. By a highly visible research tradition, shed means that the following must be observable over a reasonable period of time. Provision for a reasonable budget, quality of completed outputs, measurable result such as publication, etc., Involvement in research of a significant number of faculty members and visible, tangible, and measurable impact of research on the community. Excellence in research is therefore imperative for program accreditation. It is obviously impossible for a degree program to reach the highest level of accreditation, which is level 4, if there are no observable proofs of the program's excellence in research. Number three is SOOC leveling. For state universities and colleges in the country, a mechanism called SOOC leveling is put in place jointly by the Commission on Higher Education and Department of Budget and Management through the issuance of DBM CHED Joint Circular Number 1-A Series of 2003 entitled SOOC Leveling Instrument and Guidelines for the Implementation Thereof. This was revised through DBM CHED Joint Circular Number 1, Series of 2016, which seeks for the categorization of the different types of institutions from Level 1 to Level 5, which the latter as the highest in terms of institutional performance indexed to the four key result areas with corresponding points. KRA1 is quality and relevance of institution with 16 points. KRA2 is research capability and output with 14 points. KRA3, which is services to the community with 14 points. And KRA4 is management of resources with seven points for a total of 51 points. The 14 points for research capability and output is broken down into six components namely research center including percentage of researchers to the total regular faculty three points externally funded research in the past three years two points completed research-based papers published in the past three years 3.5 points research-based paper presented in the past three years three points citations in the past three years 0.5 and inventions in the past three years two points for a total of 14 points. Evidently, DBM CHED Joint Circular Number 1, Series of 2016, strongly mandates all state universities and colleges to perform the basic functions of higher education, namely instruction, research, and extension. However, universities are expected to focus more on research and graduate education. Another reason why we need to aspire for IOR is to establish institutional reputation through rankings. Global university rankings have emerged in recent years to assess the performance of higher education institutions around the world based on a set of 
predetermined indicators. It tends to place a greater emphasis on research and less on teaching and learning environments according to Pavel 2015. Three of the most known influential and widely observed international university rankings are Academic Ranking World Universities or ARWU, Quacquarelli, Simmons or QS World University Rankings, and Times Higher Education or THE World University Rankings. Now, each of these university ranking systems has an entirely unique methodology or set of criteria. In the case of RWU, its methodology includes, among others, 20% for highly cited researches. In the case of ARWU, its methodology includes, among others, 20% for highly cited researchers in 21 broad subject categories, another 20% for papers published in Nature and Science, and another 20% for papers indexed in Science Citation Index or SCI, Expanded and Social Science Citation Index or SSCI. A total of 60% of the entire 100% is assigned for research, which is measured in terms of citation, publication, and indexation. When it comes to the methodology of QS, two of the six metrics are directly related to research, namely citation per faculty, which is 20%, and academic reputation, which is 40%. A total of 60%, therefore, is assigned for research. Specifically, the data on citation is sourced from Elsevier Scopus database, the world's largest repository of academic journal data. This is completely unbiased and universities have no control over this data. Meanwhile, to measure a school's academic reputation, surveys are sent to 100,000 academic experts who ask to mark the university excellence of other universities. These experts are not allowed to vote for their own school but instead must select another school they believe has excellent research. This is to remove any potential bias. The methodology of Times Higher Education World University Ranking shows that two out of the five indicators of university performance are on research, namely volume of income from and reputation on research, which is 30%, and citations, which is also assigned 30%. This goes to show that 60% out of 100% is assigned to research. Now, when we compare the methodology of ARWU, QS, and THE, it is pretty obvious that there are a lot of similitudes between the criteria and indicators used by each ranking, but the weights are sometimes different. Nevertheless, the predominant criteria are publication, indexation and citation. It goes without saying that research is a major and critical criterion in world university rankings. Internationalization is not a goal in itself, but a means to enhance the quality and make a meaningful contribution to society. To this effect, I would like to argue that the greatest and most meaningful contribution that research can make to society is the promotion of social justice. By social justice, we mean equal rights and equitable opportunities for all. Through research, specifically through the new knowledge it produces, we hope it can open doors of access and opportunity for everyone, especially the underprivileged, underserved, marginalized, and vulnerable sectors of society. Moving on, how do you think the Philippines fare in Southeast Asian countries and the rest of the world in terms of research performance. Based on available data from the Global Innovation Index, the Philippines ranked 54th out of 129 countries using the three criteria, namely research and development expenditure, patents, and scientific articles. It appears that the production of scientific article is the weakest point of the country. Moreover, the Global Competitiveness Index, or GCI, by the World Economic Forum 
measures the world's competitiveness landscape in 144 countries across 12 broad categories. The Philippines' ability to attract and retain talent remains low, although there were some improvements in 2014 compared with the previous year. The country's ability to retain talent moved up to 60th place in the world from 71st, as did its ability to attract talent up four places at 82nd. This table compares the Philippines with its peers on a number of indicators measuring research capability. The Philippines' research capability indicated by the number of researchers per million population is the lowest in the group. Spending on research and development is also low compared to the Asian peer group. Collectively, Asian produced 2.2% of the world's research output. Malaysia has maintained a high growth rate above the world's average in research output and is the most productive country in the region aside from Singapore. Thailand comes second in research output, national spending on R&D, and the number of full-time researchers in the country. The Philippines' research output is the lowest in the group. Furthermore, based on available data from the Scopus database regarding the research productivity of top Asian HEIs, it is sad to note that the top HEIs in the Philippines are not producing as much number of Scopus Index publications as compared to the top HEIs in the region like the University of Malaya in Malaysia and the Mahido University in Thailand. In fact, the number of Scopus indexed publications in the years 2017 and 2018 of the Philippines across HEIs combined, the one in gray bars, is lower compared to the publications in one HEI in Malaysia, which is the University of Malaya, the one in brown. Nevertheless, the top contributors to the country's research productivity in terms of Scopus index publications are HEIs in the National Capital Region namely University of the Philippines Diliman, Ateneo de Manila University, University of the Philippines Manila, University of Santo Tomas, and De La Salle University. Meanwhile, in terms of the world university rankings, the University of the Philippines placed 69th among the top 634 higher educational institutions of Asia in the latest rankings released by Quacquarelli Simmons or QS. The QS Asia University Rankings 2021 UP placed three ranks higher than in the previous year's edition and emerged among the top 11% of Asian HEIs. However, the four best universities in the Philippines are still not enough with respect to world university rankings. According to the 2022 QS World University Rankings, UP and UST slide down in ranking on the annual list of the world's top universities, which covers 1,300 universities around the globe. From a ranking of 369 in 2020, UP slid down to 399 in 2021. UST as well slid down from a ranking of 801 to 1,000 in 2020 to 1,001 to 1,200 in 2021. Both Ateneo de Manila and De La Salle University were able to maintain their ranking. Nevertheless, UP is still the best higher education institution in the country. In my own analysis, the three major indicators of IOR are the following, publication in indexed journals, citations, and meaningful contribution to society. Here are a few strategies for the future success of IOR in the Philippines. Since faculty members are the ones who are expected to do research, it is logical that we strengthen their skills to do so. While there is a wide spectrum of research topics that could serve as the focus of lectures or training activities, that is from proposal writing to publication, it would be more pragmatic and beneficial if we first conduct a needs assessment of the research topics which require intervention. In other words, we have to identify first the weakness of the faculty with regard to research before we introduce any skills enhancement or capacity building initiative related to research. The financial aspect of letting faculty members participate in research related lectures and training activities should not be a major concern in the institution since the National Research Council of the Philippines is offering 
a wide array of free webinars. To further the faculty's research skills, it may prove beneficial to revisit the HEI's qualifications in hiring would-be faculty members. In some cases, the Human Resource Management Office in certain institutions evaluate only the academic records, interview and teaching performance of applicants. A criterion on research or research skills may therefore be added in the existing hiring standards of HEIs. Aside from making sure that faculty's researches are anchored on the programs and the institution's research agenda, it is also sound that faculty members anchor their researches on one of the five sectors of DOST's harmonized national research and development agenda, namely National Integrated Basic Research Agenda, Health, Agriculture, Aquatic, and Natural Resources Sector, Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology, and Disaster Risk Reduction and Climate Change Adaptation, which are likewise aligned with the country's Ambition Natin 2040, which is founded on the three pillars, namely Malasakit, Pagbabago, and Kaunlaran. Furthermore, to give international relevance to faculty's researches, it is best that they align their researches to one of the United Nations 17 Sustainability Development Goals, namely no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean water, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate change, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnerships for the goal. For institutions that are only starting their efforts to internationalize research, it is a good move to manifest your intention to collaborate with researchers from the Philippines and abroad with strong global visibility. With strong global visibility, I mean those researchers who have had successful research engagements with researchers from other countries and those who are highly cited in their respective disciplines. These Filipino researchers with strong global visibility are our guides in connecting ourselves and our institution to the rest of the world. Certainly, these kind of people can help us navigate research from a global perspective considering their rich experience. Filipino researchers, scientists, and scholars with global exposure and networks are our ticket or bridge to get us connected to other researchers, scientists, and scholars across the globe. This can be done by availing of DOST's Balik Scientist program. If you have identified that there is an absence or a lack of scientific and technological expertise in your institution, you may coordinate with DUST and express your intention to be a host institution that will undertake science, technology, and innovation activities or research and development initiatives with a Balik scientist who is a science, technology, or innovation expert or professional who will undertake certain activities along his or her field of expertise. Balik scientists are Filipino scientists, technologists, and experts who work outside the country and are willing to return to the country and share their expertise in order to promote scientific, agro-industrial, and economic development, including the development of our human capital in science, technology, and innovation. Aside from benefiting from the expertise of foreign researchers and scholars with strong global presence, collaborating with them is also a way to benchmark with their institution's best practices in doing research. Researchers from foreign HEIs may have proven and tested policies and strategies that bolster their research performance that Filipino researchers can possibly adapt. A study carried out for the Department of Business Innovation and Skills concluded that the research produced in international collaboration was of the highest quality. IOR does not imply that we forget altogether our local and national interests in favor of the international interest. Instead, it wants us to seamlessly marry the local, national, and international relevance of our research. So, if a research project has local and national relevance, well and good. However, it is best if such project 
will also find its international relevance. After all, we live in just but one borderless world that values the worldwide consumption of knowledge. As publishing becomes increasingly competitive, authors do not simply publish elsewhere. Rather, research scholars situate that they publish their articles in journals that are indexed by prestigious and leading databases. This is so since indexing is critical for credibility, outreach, and reputation. Journal indexing assists in maintaining publication ethics and increasing the validity, visibility, and readership of the article according to Morod 2021. Four of the world's most popular indexing databases are Scopus, hosted by Elsevier, Web of Science, hosted by Clarivate Analytics, PubMed, hosted by National Center for Biotechnology Information, and Directory of Open Access Journals, or DOAJ. Publishing an article in a journal indexed by any of these four databases increases the article's discoverability or visibility and impact through citation. Hence, the advantages of publishing research articles in indexed journals cannot be overstated. To further motivate faculty members to publish their papers in popular indexing databases like Scopus and Web of Science, I know some HEIs in the country that provide incentives for such. This is another strategy for the internationalization of research that HEIs may consider. The strategy that I personally consider as best in promoting IOR is for every faculty member to set an individual research agenda and commit to them as his or her professional and or social mission. The so-called individual research agenda will answer fundamental questions like what specific research topic or topics would you like to focus on in your professional career? How are you going to ensure that the research topic or topics you have chosen are highly relevant among your peers in your discipline and significant among policymakers as the case may be? How many research projects or projects should you complete in a year? How many paper or papers should you publish in a year in journals indexed in popular databases? How exactly are you going to collaborate with your peers from other HEIs? What exactly should you do for your researches to gain citations, achieve social impact, and make meaningful contribution in society through your articles. It may therefore prove helpful to realize IOR at a more personal level if individual faculty members set their own research agenda, not only as an academic mission, but more importantly as a social mission to contribute to the fund of knowledge in one's discipline and eventually promote global social justice as the case may be. After all, we are citizens in this single planet. This slide summarizes the six strategies for IOR are in the Philippines that I presented earlier. Now, embracing the internationalization of research in the Philippines is not like a walk in the park. It is a daunting task to take. Here are some of the challenges of IOR in the country. First is attracting the best and the brightest faculty applicants and keeping them. Anchored on the basic assumption that research is a human activity, attracting and maintaining an excellent and competent human resource to do the job is extremely challenging. Attracting the best and the brightest faculty applicants will also challenge the administration to review its compensation scheme considering the HEI's fiscal condition. Is our current compensation scheme attractive enough to draw the best and the brightest? Is the faculty's salary sufficient enough to compensate the workload? we expect them to perform? Is the HEI's compensation scheme sufficient enough to keep highly performing researchers and scholars? Lastly, is our compensation scheme comparable to the compensation scheme of other colleges and universities in the country? If so, is it comparable to that of other colleges and universities in the Asian region? Answering these questions must be a real challenge for the top management. The second challenge is requiring faculty members to submit quality proposals and conduct the same once approved. Another challenge that HEIs have to hurdle is on how to expect faculty members submit quality proposals and conduct the same once approved considering the fact that they have to fulfill as well their function and instruction, they prepare their classes, they evaluate student outputs, not to mention the fact that some faculty members have designations, in some cases, multiple designations. 
The third challenge is getting the commitment of Filipino and foreign researchers, scientists, and scholars to collaborate with us. There is no denying that IOR is a complex process. Success in IOR does not happen overnight. Thus, another challenge relative to IOR is how to get the 100% commitment of Filipino and foreign researchers, scientists, and scholars from other institutions and countries to collaborate with us. A 100% commitment from other researchers, scientists, and scholars is extremely necessary since IOR entails constant mentorship and coaching. The fourth challenge is sustaining collaborations with established researchers, scientists, and scholars. Getting the commitment of other researchers, scientists, and scholars to collaborate with us is one thing. Sustaining their commitment and enthusiasm is another challenge in the internationalization of research. The fifth challenge is maintaining institutions' commitment through administrative policies and support on research. Embracing IOR obviously requires some financial considerations for institutions that are making baby steps to embrace this matter internationalization at home is a more viable strategy that is we put less emphasis first on outward mobility of students and faculty but more emphasis first on inward mobility of experts from other countries to the host institution in the philippines the sixth challenge is making research relevant to peers and policymakers to achieve social impact and promote social justice it's good to go back to the very reason why we do research we do research not only to advance our career or professional life not even to build our own research portfolio through the number of publications and citations it would be too selfish of us if these are our only motivations conversely we do research because we want to contribute in the knowledge generation in our own disciplines in nation building and in improving the quality of human and non-human life the greatest challenge then is to transcend from our personal reasons in doing research to the lofty and noble intention of creating positive impact and promoting social justice. This slide summarizes the challenges of IOR in the Philippines. This slide summarizes both the strategies for and challenges of IOR in the Philippines. With all these said, here are a few takeaways. IOR in the Philippines does not happen in a snap of a finger or blink of an eye. I would like to argue that it even takes a lifetime to succeed in IOR. In fact, those universities in the country and abroad that consistently obtain high rankings are centuries-old institutions with a long history and solid foundation of research. Despite the considerable length of time needed to put IOR in place, we will never get closer to it unless and until we get started. Aside from the amount of time required to fully realize IOR in the country, IOR also demands synergy between and among stakeholders. The combined action and cooperation of everyone involved in IOR, the HEI top management, faculty researchers, students, staff, experts from other HEIs among others, is highly important to achieve IOR in the Philippines. While a high number of completed research projects and a high number of publications matter a lot, what matters most is how these completed research projects and publications translate into the generation or modification of existing knowledge and into the creation of positive impact and promotion of social justice. Research is not an end-all be-all enterprise. It is only a means towards a greater end, and that is to make meaningful contribution in the society nation and the world by promoting scientific knowledge and advocating for social justice doing research is a mission to make meaningful contribution by promoting social justice in short research is not only there to inform but transform what needs to be transformed summing up i can say that the future of internationalization of research in the philippines is still in its infancy stage while few 
HEIs in the country are at par with other top universities in the region. However, most HEIs in the country are still lagging behind. More brainstorming among stakeholders have yet to be conducted. More policies have yet to be crafted. More strategic efforts have yet to be exerted. More partnerships have yet to be forged. And more quality and relevant researches have yet to be published in international and peer-reviewed journals. I hope this keynote lecture will spur discussions among academic leaders and stakeholders to think about how to position or reposition their respective institutions such that they will address the challenges of internationalization of research and operationalize the strategies to make them work. These are the references used in this presentation. That ends my talk. Thank you all so much for your attention. Mabuhay ang Holy Cross of Davao College at mabuhay tayong lahat.